Shalom, Shabbat, Adonai. Welcome to the 6th Exodus program. Thank you for listening. The name of this segment is Keeping the Ten Commandments is an honor. Keeping the Ten Commandments is an honor. I'd like to read to you the Ten Commandments. And, um, have a few comments out of the ways and how how beautiful they are. Okay, let's read over the Ten Commandments. This uh, I'm reading from the New International Version. Okay, let's begin. We're coming from Exodus chapter 20. The first command. I am the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, simply put, there is but one God. The only way you can have another God is that you make it with your own hands. Or, of course, you can have gods that you worship, such as material things, even loved ones, family, money, houses, anything material. Okay. The second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of their parents to the third and the fourth generation of those that who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Again, this is practically saying the same thing. It's not to make any images, not to draw, worship, or idolize any of them. Okay, now the country which we live in, America, have idols. Every they make them every day. They love to make idols, and if you don't worship their idols, they become mad with you, and say you're not American. And you're not a patriotic. For example, one of the idols is Santa Claus and Jesus and Easter Bunny. And they give every reason for you to want to be a part of that celebration. And the Lord said clearly for us, for the heathens, they like to worship those idols. And if, they don't, if you don't worship them, then they're mad with you. And they can't understand why. That you don't want to. Because it's written right here. Do not worship them. Bow down to them. Now uh, in America also. A lot of these sports. Athletes. Now it's not the athletes. It's the owners of these. Of these country in America. That they worship animals. All of their sports. Uh, their. Logos. Just about every one of them, not all, but almost all college and professional, all of them make idols relating to animals or things in the sky or things under the water, things that God tells us not to, not to worship. In America, the heathens, they like to worship these things. In particular, they wear them as badges, as something important. But the Lord says right here, not to do these things, not to make them. So they have made their own icons. They love their idols. Easter, Christmas, all of their, all of their holidays are idolaters. And they want you to worship this little leprechaun. And they make all these, these idols every day. They make them. They come up with new idols every day. 
Now we had a man in our in our Bible called Zacchaeus. Okay, Zacchaeus climbed up the sycamore tree to see the Lord because of all the miracles and all the works that he was doing. He wanted to see who was doing all this. He may have heard of um, Mary's brother being raised from the dead and wanted to see who was this doing all this healing. And he climbed up a sycamore tree. But there's a leprechaun tell you to follow a rainbow. You can find a pot of gold. You see the difference between wickedness and righteousness? Okay, now, let's go to the third. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Well, to the blessings that most people do not know the Son of God's name and they don't know the Most High name. Okay, um, here in America and most of all the earth, Satan has deceived the whole world and got everybody worshiping this thing that doesn't even exist. It's only a picture of a white man with blue eyes and blonde hair. It's not a person at all, never been a person. This is what the Catholic Church, the Jewish people, they have their gods too. They stand at a wall and pray to it all day long. In America and people around the world, they pray to a white picture, a white man's picture, and they bow down to it, cry, and then go dress up and paint their face and go pray to it every Sunday or every chance they get out to an opportunity to, they would go and do such. And then they have these great days. They celebrate for themselves to go worship the idols and buy clothes and spend hundreds and thousands of dollars to go worship the idols. Christmas, Easter, they come up with new ways to spend money and to worship idols every day. In the spring, in the summer, you got to have new clothes to go worship your idols. You gotta worship those idols. And the thing about it is that they make them themselves. They make their own idols. But at the same time, um, this here is talking about the name, but no one knows his name. They go, they call them their idols, and they pray to them, and they sing songs to them. All year round, they sing songs to their idols. Oh, Jesus, amen. And it's the Lord laughs about it. And he said, you're praying to the stalk of a tree. You don't get it. Isaiah chapter 44, 45. You bow down to the stalk. The Lord said, you bow down to the stalk of a tree. The Most High said, you pray, Father, save me. Now, this is the Lord. This is what the Most High is saying. To you heathens that are bowed down worshiping the stock of a tree because a pitcher is made from wood and wood come from a tree. But you don't get it that you bow down to the stock of a tree. Okay, so you've already polluted yourselves by making your own idols. And that's number four. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's within them. But he rested on the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, now, the heathens worship their God on Sunday. Just about all their pictures, they put a little round circle around people who they deem to be holy or saints. You can see it all the way back to... Uh, the Council of Nicaea, back to 300 uh, 
325 AD, I believe it is. All of their councils, they decide to do this in their paintings. The Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople. All of their councils they had, the Catholic Church made their worship on Sunday because of their sun god that they worship. So they worship on Sunday for their god. And believe it or not, a lot of people get up early. Easter Sunday, they say, because the Lord rose. And where are you going to meet him? The Lord has arisen already. So they go to Sunday, uh, Easter sunrise service, idolatry. Besides, read your Bible. The Lord was tried, crucified, buried, arose on preparation day. Preparation day is on Friday. Read your Bible. It happened on Friday. And for the Sabbath day, before the Sabbath day, they took him down from the tree. They took him down. So you should know that Saturday is the Sabbath day. Now, as for me, I keep the Sabbath. Um, this is the way I do it. Preparation day, I prepare my meals, what I'm going to eat on Saturday, which is the Sabbath. I most of the time cater my food, what I plan to eat or what I want to eat for those days. And as much as I want to eat or need to eat or think that I'm going to eat, I will buy it the day before Friday and, um, I will eat like a bird all during the Sabbath and sleep. That's the way I do. I don't wash any dishes. I don't empty the rubbish. I do nothing. I listen mostly to the word of God on my uh, on my smartphone. I download the Bible and I listen to that. I pray. Sometimes I read, but most of the time I don't. Um, because it's a rest day, it's supposed to rest. And while you're reading, your mind is not resting. And so, it might be somewhat difficult. I mean, first starting off, that's why you need to practice. And when you practice keeping the Sabbath and keeping God's laws, it will come easier, more easier to you. At the beginning, it may be a little difficult to sit down in one place or to be still. Okay, these first four laws that I read to you, they pertain to God. Okay? They pertain to God. God is saying, I want you to do this for me. Okay, now the next six laws, they pertain to man or they pertain to you as a person. God said, do this for yourself and do this for your brother. Okay? Number number five, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord thy God giveth you. Okay, respect your parents. Do not curse them. Do not blaspheme them. Do not talk back to them. Do not mock them. Do not make fun of them. Make fun of their education or the lack of. Respect your parents. Number six, do not murder. There's no need for you to kill anyone or anything. Okay. Now our ancestors, they went and um, they uh, they had the celebrations and they mostly ate fruits. I mean, you can eat meats anytime you want. The book in Leviticus 11 tell you what food to eat and what not to eat. Okay. Now, uh, but don't kill your brothers and sisters. There's no need for you to be angry. I tell you, you need to, in this world, in this society in America, you need to empty yourself. Because there are so many things going on in the world. The devil can go in your mind, out of your mind, like a revolving door. 
and the things that go on in this country on a daily basis with all these unclean spirits and demons everywhere. You need to empty yourself. All these things can weigh you down. Okay, what people say, what people do, things, people, um, just constantly things every day is coming at you. And the bombardment of ideologies and sayings and innuendos and subliminal messages all day long, they are geared at you. You need to empty yourself. And to do that, you need to practice. Okay, practice emptying yourself that you can learn how to take the things out of your mind, even hatred and uh, any evil speaking. Don't let these things dwell in you. And always say, give the devil an eviction notice. Don't let that rascal take up any space in your mind. Serve him an eviction notice and put him out. Don't think about the devil and what he does and what he do. And what he's saying or anything he's saying, you don't talk to him. Just give him an eviction notice and put him out of your mind. You don't need to dwell on that rascal. Okay? Okay. So don't let people don't let people make you angry. And as much as you want to help God's people, and as much as you want them to see what they're doing is wrong. Even your children, your family members. And it's good to want to save people, but you cannot make them okay you cannot make them be saved you cannot help them in that perspective the only thing you can do is tell them pray for them and of course you can present your message to them many times but package it in a different way let me give you a scenario what I mean by packaging okay now God has made us fishers of men and uh, but uh, when you have a package or a gift for someone, a lot of times it's how you package it. It makes it look good. Doesn't mean a big box is something that's really nice. Sometimes a small box has good things in it. But at the same time, it's your packaging is how you wrap it up, and it's how you present what you what you the gift you're going to give. Now, anyway, everyone loves a gift. Mostly everybody. They like a surprise, especially so. Preparing your gifts or preparing what you have to say is as equally as important as giving or receiving a gift. So the word of God is a gift. But to be able to see the gift, they have to receive it in the present. Okay, the present makes it a best gift. Okay, so think about what you're going to say. And a lot of times, uh, bring your messages down so that they can digest what you're saying. If they are blind and they don't know that they are serving idols and they are hardwired in, they would not want to easily so much as give up their idols that they are serving. But you can prepare a message and you can fish for them by preparing your message at a different time. And praying how to talk to this person to get them. Now, you don't need to use uh, strategies or anything like that. But you should think about what to say to this person. How to minister. And to come at them in a humble perspective. Talk to them in a humble way. Don't be braggadocious or uh, present a lot of knowledge to them. Or big words or speak uh, Hebrew or Greek or Latin. Don't appeal to them as you're smarter and that you know more than they know. And of course, you always have to have a balance because uh, most people, they think um, if you're, you're telling them something, then they will think not in the way that you're thinking. They're thinking that um, you're, you're they thinking that you're saying, oh, you're dumb. And you don't know nothing. And I'm smart. A lot of people think this way. They don't think that you're trying to help them. Or trying to help them to get their their knowledge. Or help them to be saved. 
they don't see it from that perspective. They can't see from you what you're coming from or what you're trying to do. That's why you need to package your message. And when you're, when you're talking to them, stay with one message. Uh, don't go to two or three different topics at one time. Stay with one topic throughout your conversation. And you don't have to uh, convince them that day. And you, don't, you might not see the, uh, the rewards or the fruits that day. Just plan a seed that day. Wait a few days or a couple of days or a week or month or whatever. Talk to them again. Uh, download some information. Send them some text messages. Send them a DVD or, uh, or uh, one of these awesome videos the brothers and sisters are making. And um, send them a text message or um, a scripture. And that's all. Uh, just let time go by. Okay, and just share, share. Ask them, say, hey, do you mind if I share this with you? What I got out of this? And uh, say to them, like, what do you get out of this? And what's your perspective on this? What you get out of this? I understand it like this. How do you stand it? You know, greet them like a brother and be tender hearted and present your message that God may be glorified and get the praise out of your life and out of that person's life. Who brother who you want to be saved. Sister that you want to be saved. Okay. Now the next one is uh, number seven. Do not commit adultery. Now. It's a beautiful thing being married. And. Um, one should always. When planning to marry. I think it's a good thing to marry your friend. Or your best friend. On both perspective, male and female, to marry your best friend, it's a it's a, it's a long relationship. I've seen to blossom very nice, and um, and remember when you get married, and when you are married, and you sought God's counsel for the marriage, and not in lust, but to just like uh, the covenant that God has made, that you made with this mate. And a lot of times, you know, I'm sure you have found out if not already, marriage is not a perfect institution. It's a good institution in the fact that God has ordained it. But a lot of times when you are married, you grow when you're married. You don't stay the same as you first got married. Neither couple stays the same. Their thoughts, their morals, their mores, the food they like. The colors they like, what they like to wear, what they like to drive, what they like to eat, they change. While you're married with them, you stay in the same house with them, but they change. And you have to allow your partner to change and to support them and to communicate with them often and uh, to do things for them. Um, pre you should always think to um, not to take your mate for granted and uh, pre-think what your partner wants and give it to them before they ask for it. Anticipate their needs and desires every day. Anticipate and don't think that is going to be reciprocal. Do it from your bottom of your heart without wanting anything in return. And try every day to anticipate your partner's, your spouse's needs and desires. For example, when they come home, you have food already cooked. Or have some nice hot bath water ready for them. And uh, some nice cold water or some Kool-Aid or whatever they like to drink. Have it prepared for them when they come in. You know, surprise them one day. And uh, tell them to sit down and take your shoes off. You know, take the shoes off. Well, yeah, knock their feet off. And, um, you know, wash their back for them when they take a bath. You know, just knock on the door and say, hey, do you mind if I come in and wash your back for you? And uh, wash their back for them. I mean, this is your spouse. This is your mate. Okay, show them that you love them. And your relationship will go a long way. And there'll be no need for you to commit adultery because you have all you have right in front of you. Okay? 
The next, number nine, I'm sorry, number eight, do not steal. There's no need to steal from anyone, from a store, market. You know, I guess sometimes people will kind of help you if you are hungry. And you tell someone you're hungry, they will give you food. And you wouldn't have to steal. But if you're lusting after what someone else has, then you're more, um, you'll be more gravitated to steal or to take what don't belong to you. Uh, that's including another man's wife or his car or his personal thing, clothing, any material thing, okay? So you don't want to do that. Don't steal. You know, pray. Ask God to bless you with what you what you desire. He knows what your needs are. Okay, number nine. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Sometimes we have good neighbors and sometimes we don't have good neighbors. We don't get a chance to choose who lives next door to us. But we do get a chance to old man, no man love. A lot of times your neighbors that's going to be around you. Sometimes they'll come and borrow sugar. Uh, food, tea, butter, or want you to take them anywhere and never give you a tip or put gas in the car. They always want to say thank you, but they don't never give you anything. And, but don't your brothers and sisters. Okay, so, but help them if you can. Okay, but don't say things like, man, these jokers right here, man, these jokers are throwing in my flesh. Don't say that. Uh, love your brothers and it could be you. Okay, so if you have the upper hand and you're being blessed financially and your brothers and sisters are not, you know, go ahead and help them out. You got a little bit of extra money, put it in their hands. Just walk up to them and just, you know, look like you want to shake their hand, but have a 20 or a 50 or or $100 and put it in your hand. Sometimes you can only give a five. But that'll go a long way. You won't believe how important that five little dollars will make a person. Or even one. Sometimes you can just go when you go to the store. Think about your neighbor. And buy them a snicker bar. Or a bag of potato chips and bring it to them. And say, I was thinking about you. You know, do it for your wife also. But if you're married, don't do it for somebody else. Um, but do it to your neighbors. And I'll show you show some love. Or when you go into the store and you go shopping and you see a nice t-shirt, buy a t-shirt and um, bring it to your neighbor, give it to him. It goes a long way, okay? Uh, but don't give false testimonies against your neighbors, no matter what kind of attitude they have or how they talk or how uh, deplorable their language is or if they don't speak good proper English. They speak mostly Ebonics and all of their language they only say Ebonics, but they never speak English. They only speak Ebonics. Okay, number 10, the 10th one. You should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or his female servants, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Okay, now, um, we have blessed people in America, a lot of blessed people, a lot of black people that are, are rich. But it's amazing that um, even a lot of our black people are rich. We still treat it very poorly and not respected at all by our oppressors. I've seen many, many, um, many black people, very successful very rich I remember a few years ago I don't remember and I think it was in passing I don't think it was a movie it might have been but I didn't watch it or see it it was just in passing something that I heard I think the actor was Chris Rock I'm not sure but he asked uh, he actually said he actually think he was talking to a white person and he said to them I Chris Rock, I think he said that. He said I got money. I got, I got, I got money. And he said, "Would you want to be black and have all the money that I have?" And the white man said, "No, you would not want to be black. No, 
and be a millionaire. He said, no, I would not want to be black and be a millionaire. He said, I wouldn't want to be black at all. Okay, so um, we have uh, a lot of people who are millionaires. O.J. Simpson, Bill Cosby, Michael Jackson, Prince, Whitney Houston. All these people are millionaires, talented. Oh, I mean, household names, household names. And you see how they are treated by the oppressors? And this is going to have been going on for years since we've been here in America. And um, they they like us for the money that we make, uh, including Tiger Woods. They like us for the money that we make. But at the same time, um, there is no love. There is no love for us. Only if they can get your money or if they can peer beside you and tell some of their friends, I met this person, I saw this person, so they can be great themselves. But as far as caring about us, not one bit. Not at all. Not at all. I think in my whole lifetime, I met one white person that was good to me. That's all I met, one. He was good to me. Well, he said kind, kind words to me. Um, you know, besides meeting teachers, uh, most teachers, they are compassionate and empathetic. Teachers that I've, um, that I've interacted with, the white teachers, most of the white teachers I've met, they are empathetic and compassionate. I haven't had any problems with any white teachers. Um, coaches are the same. Most coaches are compassionate and empathetic. Most, not all, but they're uh, kind of like uh, people that you can talk to. Okay, now let me let me continue here. I would like to show and tell you and to share with you the the compassion that God has put in His Ten Commandments. I would like to read to you the ten utterances of God. But before I do that, I would like to share with you what God has done as far as letting us see how much he wants us to keep his Ten Commandments and how much uh, you should love them and to keep them because he put a lot into it. Um, also, I was wondering, have you thought about these things? Did you know that there are ten holes in our body? Seven in our head and the rest of the holes through our body. Women have 10 holes. A man have, a woman have 11 holes. A man have 10 holes in his body. And they have different functions. Also, the, the fluids that go through our body are very important also what God has done. It's, 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 it's very beautiful. And I want to share this with you. The fluids in our body, we have blood, urine, bile, plasma, breast milk, semen, water. 6% of our body is fluid. Earwax, mucus, pulse, saliva, skin oil, sweat, tears, vaginal secretion. Urine, all of these things are in our body and they have an ebb flow. It has an ebb. And it's all eurythmic. It all works together and none of them touch each other. None of them come in contact with each other. Except as if they was coming out of our bodies. But throughout our body, they never go inside of our bodies. Okay. Uh, I also, did I say saliva or spit? Yeah, that too. Okay, all these things go through our bodies. These seven holes in our head and the ten holes throughout our entire body. Our entire body. And um, the recurrence and the eurythmic pattern of coming and going, uh, decline and regrowth throughout our body. The flux of the tide 
toward the sea, the flood and the drain. The flood and the drain. This is the air flow. It goes like your water comes to the sea, then it goes back into the ocean. The whole earth is this way. And to keep God's law, you will be in union with this air flow. As your body, God has made your body this air flow. It will do the same thing by keeping God's law. You will be in air flow with God, with nature, and with man if you keep his Ten Commandments. Okay, you understand? Now, concerning these ten holes in your body, God had given you ten organs that goes along with them. In the Ten Commandments, these ten organs, I will tell you them. Your lungs, your liver, your bladder, your kidney, your heart, stomach, intestines, large and small, your brain, your spleen, and pancreas. Okay? Let me tell you that again. Number one, lungs. Number two, silver, liver. Number three, bladder. Number four, kidney. Number five, heart. Number six, stomach. Number seven, intestines, large and small. Number eight, brain. Number nine, spleen. Number ten, pancreas. All of these ten organs, the ten holes in your bodies, the ten commandments, and the ten utterances of God, they are to work in the airflow in unison and your rhythmic with God, with man. So when you keep these laws here, you will be in order and with God, and you'll be in order with man, and you will be opposite of what Satan is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do these things, and you'll be in tune with God. You don't do them, you are out of tune with God, and you're in tune with the devil because you are lawlessness. You do not obey laws, and you do not want to keep them. So you want to use the temple of God to be a demon. Okay? God also gave you some beautiful things. He gave you ten fingers, and he gave you ten toes. All of these things do in the glory of God. That you would know how beautiful God is and what he has made you to be in his image. So keeping his laws, you are in ebb with him. Okay? Okay, I don't want you to make this segment too long. So I'm going to read you the ten utterances of God. God said this ten times. And I tell you something that's beautiful. That the uh, That wisdom she showed me. When she showed me this, I was floored. I couldn't get up. It's the same thing as the Ten Commandments. And it's beautiful. And see how God created the universe. You and the Ten Commandments. They are the same thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, the second utterance. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay, the waters from the waters mean people. So God's saying that you, you divide, you are divided from the heathens. God said, you are my people. So you're not heathens. So God divided the firmaments. They mean God divided you, okay, from the heathens. You are not to be like them or try to associate with them or to have sexual relationships with them or any such thing. Don't try to be like them because you are different from them. You're, they will hate you. The world will hate you because God has chosen you, so they're going to hate you. Don't expect anything different. Okay, the third, and God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so.
Okay, on this third commandment, where the Lord said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And so, and it was so. So, um, what I'm saying, like, um, this is a, a very interesting contrast and uh, a, do, a dichotomy also. Because, as you know, the, the ones that are waking up, it's only what God said would happen. It would be the 144,000. And those who are asleep will not prevent those from rising. Okay. It's only what's going on. So your brothers that are asleep and they don't know what's going on because at one time we didn't know either. You know, we were just like they are. But when we woke up, we wanted others to wake up because that included the Gentiles. Okay, so, um, but we as Hebrew should not be trying to, uh, to win the praises of the Gentiles or trying to win them over. We are not here to intermingle and be accepted by the Gentiles. The Lord put our ancestors here 400 years ago because they had sinned against him. And we are taking the responsibility what God has given the, the, the trials and tribulations for us to go for our and pay for our ancestors' sin. He holding us accountable for them. And so he didn't put us here. He knew we was going to be born here, the fourth generation. But he also knew that we would be his, the chosen people too to come out, including the 144,000. And so he knew that. And he knew that how we would shine. He wrote that in Isaiah chapter 60. And he, he, said, he just, I mean, God knows everything from generation to generation. Try to keep that in mind. Every generation, he knows what will be. From every generation, from generation to generation, he knows what will be. Now, um, a lot of us have come here. And of course, they did not know and do not know. That they are Hebrew. And I don't know. But I wish everyone to be saved. I wish all the blacks that are in America. And where God has scattered us. All of us to be saved. I'm praying that way. And I especially pray. For those who are being bombarded the most. And. Um, as you can see that the people. Our oppressors. Uh, target our musicians and our actors and they want their soul have you seen that they want our people's soul and they want our people to join their fraternities and their secret societies by doing all these strange things to so that they can be so they can be famous and have money oh man you this is something this right here, it burns, it burns me up. I mean, it really burns me up. It really burns me up. That they hate us so much. That they want our soul. And not only they want our soul, but they do it by stealth. And that's why God said to us, separate yourself. That's what this scripture means here. It means that when God separated the firmament, in the heavens he separated us from the heathens and he said to us that we should not want to do what they're doing now i know a lot of us um are running for office and uh want to uh, be senators thinking that you can get things changed or that they're going to let you go to a higher status you know that's um i think from a person a person to person perspective that's what they, it's admirable for that person to obtain such a thing, to be accepted by the Gentiles. But God did not tell us to be accepted by the Gentiles. He told us not to even intermingle with them. Okay, we are here to suffer. We're not here to be liked or to be accepted, but we are here to be suffered, to practice his laws and wait for his timing, that he would take us back to the land of our ancestors. However, because there are so many, in fact, 
most of us was asleep. And the Lord did it this way. And so we do not question God's elect or his thinking or his reason or why he chose to do it this way. God is just a perfect being and holy in all of his ways. And I have no problem with what he has done. I mean, as for me, personally, when I woke up, I was I was heartbroken. And I was grieved. Every day, I'm grieved because of it. Not because of what our ancestors did to us. Of course, that was painful also. But because of the things that I did wrong. And then when I, I mean, what I did wrong, I can't change it. And I could not change it. But at the same time, I know God is perfect. So I said to myself, let every man be a liar and let God be true. So I swallowed my pride and I accepted the fact that I'm a Hebrew and I got straight on to his laws. And yeah, I lost a lot of things. I lost most of my family. But at the same time, I believe I've gained God. I believe I have. But I lost my family. And, uh, but at the same time, I've gained a family. I have all of you. All of you that are in social media, my brothers and sisters, all of you, I've gained you. So I have children, brothers and sisters, I've gained. And I, I look forward to listening to your programs daily. Honestly, if I call your names, I, uh, I'll leave someone out and they will be sad. So I'm not going to mention your names. I'm just going to tell you that I, I listen to your programs. And um, I'm very proud of you and what you're doing. I have gotten off task. Let me get back on task. Uh, verse number, this is number four. The commandment, the utterance. And God said that the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed. And a fruit a tree yielding fruit after its kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so. Okay. Now if you line these utterances with the Ten Commandments, you'll see the comparison. Uh, number five, the fifth utterance, and God said, Let there be a light in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day the night and let them be for a sign for a season and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth and it was so and uh, the six hundreds and God said let the waters bring forth abundantly and moving creatures that hath life and fowl that they may fly above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every moving creature that moveth which the waters the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind in every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters of the sea, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. In the evening, in the morning, on the fifth day. Then the seventh, the seventh utterance, and God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures, after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing, and beasts of the earth after his kind and it was so and God made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after his kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw that it was good and the eighth utterance and God said 
let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay. I'm going to pause there for a minute. Now this is uh, a very beautiful and uh, interesting uh, uh, verse, verse 26, when God saying, now this, uh, uh, this is beautiful because in the Bible saying, God said, let us make man in our image. And me and my father, we talked about this many times and um, you know because uh, in church history this was a very much debated topic through the years concerning this scripture here when he said and God said let us the word us that means that um, someone accompanies the most high and uh, the, the, the question is who was God talking to when he said, let us, because God is sovereign and he made the whole heavens and the whole earth by himself. God doesn't need any help. And so that was a big question when he said, let us. So we were thinking to, we think to ourselves, who was he talking to? And uh, that's always been a question. And who was he talking to? And, um, some people would say he was talking to the son because he was in the bosom of the father, but he was not yet manifested. Okay, he was not manifested until um, until the birth of Mary. And was he talking to the angels? Still, the question is, God doesn't need any help. So, it was he talking to himself because God seek the counsel of his own will. So it's like God speaking to himself and saying, uh, let us. So he's saying, um, I'm going here to make man in my image. But he used the word let us. So whoever he was talking to and whoever accompanied him, uh, it could have been wisdom. She could have been with him or any of the hosts of heaven to accomplish and to see the thing that he has done. Because I believe they rejoiced when he was making the earth. There were seven account, several accounts where uh, wisdom rejoiced in the book of uh, Proverbs. She rejoiced when he created the, earth, the heavens and the earth. And the son is in the bosom of the father, which is the word. So the word was there because the word was God and the word was with God. So it could be the word. So the word um, was made flesh and dwelled among us. So it could be the word. Okay. But nevertheless, it's a good, it's a good conversation of those who love God's word. Okay. I'm sorry for this going through all that that was not planned uh, the ninth and God said behold I have given you every green bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which it is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you it is it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life. And I have given green nerve for meat, and it was so. Okay. The tenth and the final and final utterance. And the Lord God said, It is not good. That man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. 
and out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every creature, living creature, that was the name thereof. Okay, now again, I want to say the ten utterance that I read to you, they are the same as the ten commandments that are in the book of Exodus. It is also what is in us. The ten things within our, our hands, our feet, our eyes, every hole that was in our body, they correspond to the ten utterances of God, the ten the Ten Commandments. This is what we should walk in. Israel, this is who we are. The nation of Israel, this is who we are. From the beginning, from Moses, even today we are in captivity here in America. This is who we are. This is our history. This is who we are as a people. This is our race. This is our culture. This is what we are. We are God's chosen people. The chosen generation. Royal priesthood. That will return back to the Lord. And keep his commandments. This is us. This is who we are. And this is what we will keep. This is what we shall do. And we will do it in the glory of God. And the glory of our ancestors. That those who are asleep. When the Lord raised them up. They will see us. And they will rejoice as Adam and Eve will rejoice as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will rejoice because what he told them, they will see with their eyes and they will see us. Look forward to it. Keep his commandments and live. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.